the uh, parking situation um, here at Coach Corner. Um, thank you for that nice introduction. Thank you, Kara, for joining me. Um, I'm going to read a little bit, and then uh, we'll talk about the book, and then I would love to answer any questions. Um, not necessarily about parenting. I suppose about parenting. I suppose that's what the book is about. Um, okay. Uh, this, so the book is, is, uh, is organized as a series of uh, essays, um, uh, sort of thematically and uh, also chronologically. Um, and this essay, uh, uh, one of the kind of through lines of the book is um, about Russia and Russian, um, my sort of struggles to teach uh, Rafi Russian, given my own limited Russian, and also uh, Rafi's resistance uh, to learning Russian, um, and my mixed feelings about Russia, um, which I know some of you share because you left Russia. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, there's a chapter at the end called Bear Dad, where I, where I kind of really uh, wrestle with, with the idea of what Russian parenting is and is not, and, and um, the extent to which I myself am a Russian parent. So um, this is the beginning of Bear Dad. I just turned six when we left the Soviet Union and I remember very little about my parents, in particular my father, in that pre-emigration period. I remember him pulling me through the snow on a sled on the way to daycare. I remember him and Masha going into a river on a summer trip outside Moscow and coming out with crayfish that we would roast on a fire. I remember him sitting at the kitchen table in our small apartment, drinking tea and reading. Once or twice, when I had really screwed up, he gave me a very reluctant and, most, and mostly ceremonious spanking I thought of him as strict and demanding and loving and mostly silent. The one incident that has remained in my mind, probably because it is so shameful, is when my friend Grisha and I got into a fight with some boys in the courtyard in front of our building. The boys knocked Grisha down and started kicking him. Instead of helping, I ran to get my father. From the courtyard, I called him through the open window. He stuck his head out. I explained the situation, and he said, figure it out yourself. Then he shut the window. By the way, my father is here tonight, if you want to <laughs> confirm any of the stories in this book. Uh, then he shut the window. Um, when I returned to Grisha, the other boys were already gone. He was picking himself up, and he was very angry that I hadn't done more to help. Figure it out yourself. In certain ways, that was my father's lesson to me. Though in other ways, he was far more involved in my life than the fathers of, of other kids I knew. One time, when I was, when I was around 12, already in the US, and wanted to go skating with some friends on a freshly frozen local pond, my dad went out, measured the ice, and declared it unsafe. My friends made fun of me for a while after that, but I didn't mind. My father was stricter than their fathers, and I knew why. It was because he was Russian, and because he was an immigrant. Their fathers had golf, jokes, in some cases girlfriends. My friend's parents had a high rate of divorce. My father just had his family. I spent the longest portion of my childhood in a suburb outside Boston called Newton. It was a nice town full of professional families, many of them Jewish. Jutin, some of us called it. And we also were Jewish. That was the reason we'd been let out. That was the reason we'd been let out of the Soviet Union. That was the reason we'd left. But we were not like the Jews among whom we now found ourselves. These American Jews were rich where we, we, where we were or had been poor, comfortable where we were maladjusted. Most of all, they seemed soft, their clothes, their carpets, their faces. Whether they were actually as soft and comfortable as they seemed, I now wonder, but at the time I saw it clearly. The men in particular. They were not like our men, like our fathers. Our fathers were tough. My dad had been an amateur boxer. His friend, Yuri Rapaport, did karate and drove his car very fast. Misha Alpirovich also did karate. The least butch and least macho of the Russian fathers I knew was tough in a different way. He was a former Soviet dissident. He had been attacked and threatened and run out of the Soviet Union by the KGB. None of these fathers were violent men, nor were they large men. They were all about five foot six, mostly worked as computer programmers, and liked to play chess. But they had come from a violent place, and they had, ha and they had, had to adapt to it. They were Russian in that sense, more Russian than Jewish, though not, of course, in Russia. We, their children, did well in school, mostly stayed out of trouble, and kept our eyes on the prize of college admission. This part I always attributed to our being Soviet, to the Soviet tradition of taking school seriously, 
of dressing up in uniforms and writing in tiny draft paper notebooks. There was also my parents' own bookishness, especially my mother's. She had read everything ever written, as far as I could tell. And I still think that played a part, though I now think it was a small part. Later on, as an adult, I met Soviet emigrate children whose parents were a lot less bookish than mine, as well as immigrants from countries that were not the Soviet Union. And yet they were, in most ways, a lot like me. It was neither Soviet habits nor Jewishness that distinguished us and pulled us along. It was the emigration itself. I think what our parents managed to communicate to us, mostly without ever needing to put it in so many words, was the precarity of our existence. Most of us remember our mothers and fathers on the way to America, the uncertainty of that process, the scariness of it. In the Soviet case, we stopped over in Austria and then Italy. Our parents sold various things they brought so we could have some cash on hand. We remember what it was like when we first arrived in, in the United States and lived with friends and relatives, then in small apartments in tough neighborhoods. We remember our parents without jobs, looking for work, most of them eventually finding work, but never feeling entirely comfortable there. We had scrambled our way into the middle class, but we knew in our bones that we could fall right out of it again. This was what our parents had taught us, not deliberately, not on purpose, but just by virtue of the journey they had taken us on. I always think that Rafi can be like me. I want him to be better and freer and happier, but as a kind of baseline, at least like me. After all, he looks like me. He shares my name. But there's no way I can recreate for Rafi the experience of our emigration, nor do I want to. I want him to have a stable, happy childhood, and I want him to stay friends forever with the kids he is friends with now. I want things to be easy for him, but I am beginning to see that this is not an unalloyed good, that it could have, in the end, its own costs. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to keep my mask on because I have a son a little bit older than yours who's heading to summer camp, sleepaway camp in a month, and, for a month. And if he gets COVID or if I get COVID, I'm out. A lot of money, so I'm keeping <laughs> my mask on. Um, I'm glad that you read from that passage, Keith, because my first question and one that I kept going back to as I was reading the book is, you know, how much do you think that our children are an extension of or a reflection of ourselves? Um, yeah, that's the, <laughs> for me, that's the, that's the, that's the big question, yeah. right? And, and um, you know, a lot of the essays are dealing with this, you know, how much of, of what I have experienced, what I have known, um, do I actually want to pass on? to, to Rafi and now his brother Ilya. Um, and in each instance, I'm, I'm not sure, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, in the, in the case of Russian, as I said, I, I have these um, very ambivalent feelings, which I inherited from um, my parents about Russia. Um, you know, and, and uh, I would love for Rafi to learn Russian to have access to Russian culture, but I don't actually want him to go to Russia. <laughs> um, so that's a very kind of um, ambivalent feeling. Um, you know, I, I had a great time playing sports as a kid, as I talk about. Um, I still like playing sports. Rafi, it's not clear whether he likes playing you sports. You have that, that scene in the book, right, where you're like, be friends with the artsy kid. That's your that's your person. <laughs> yeah, well, so, you know, and yeah, so I feel like I want him to... to, to um, you know, to be able to play sports if he wants to, even even as I know it's not the most important thing in life, right? Um, but I, I so I don't I don't know the answer. It's, it, there's this kind of, you know, you have to. Um, I mean, the sports is a great example. I, or Russian, like you have to, obviously respond uh, to what your kid is like and 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 what he wants to do. At the same time, if you don't teach him anything, <laughs> um, there's not really going to be anything that he wants to do or is capable of doing. So it's, I, I have not figured this out. So, you know, it's interesting. One thing that struck me, and I write a lot about this in The Globe, too, the different parenting. There, I mean, you, I don't know how you found time to read all this stuff while your children were so little, but they you were, explored a lot of different... Uh, fall asleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Um, parenting philosophies, I mean, how much do you think that these different parenting books and techniques and philosophies, and you write about the sleep training and all of that, and the behavior with the stickers, 
does it matter? How much does that, you know, really matter? Maybe that's something we won't find out until our own kids are, are grown and we have the benefit of time to look back. But how much do you think that weight does that really hold? Or is it more just instinct in the moment, trying to do the next right thing? I, don't, I mean, so, you know, so in the book, you know, so Rafi was a pretty difficult kid, pretty much from the beginning. He, would, he was colicky, right? He used to cry a lot um, as an infant, and he got a little older. He would, I guess all kids put stuff in their mouths. I feel like Rafi put more stuff in his mouth. One time we had these uh, water bugs, they were these kind of giant cockroaches. And and one one morning I like I don't know I turned away for a second and I turned back around and Rafi has this giant cockroach in his mouth and um, but I heroically you know pulled it out and crushed it on the throat um, and now I, he loves he loves that story he really loves telling that story um, so yeah so he was he was not an easy kid and and we were not um, I mean one of the kind of interesting or one of the unique qualities of American parenting um, maybe especially in New York, right, where so many people have moved there from somewhere else, is you don't have a lot of grandparents around. You don't have your own parents around to kind of be like, you know, <laughs> you're a terrible parent. <laughs> no, or, or, you know, you should do it like this, or here's how we did it, right? Like, so I think, I think there's a kind of reinvention of parenting in every generation regardless. Um, but I, I do think, uh, you know, in, in, in the U.S., in kind of, I don't know, uh, urban environments where, where people have moved from somewhere else, right? Um, but there's, there's not a lot of grandparents around to kind of pass on the tradition. So, so you really do end up sort of on your own in trying to figure it out. So, um, so you asked about, you know, the books, right? Like, I read them because I was desperate, right? Yeah. I was, you know, with the sleep training because he wasn't a good sleeper, and, and we're like, how do we kind of address this? And then in particular, with the... Uh, um, with the behavioral stuff when he, when he turned three, um, you know, and, and I found it, you know, I, I was reading them, somebody asked me if I read them um, as, a, as a, you know, research for my book, and right. I was like, no, I, no, I assure you, I really read them because I wanted, you know, advice, um, and the advice is very interesting because it's contradictory, right, so there's, there's the kind of sticker chart, this kind of behaviorist um, model where you ignore, um, you ignore bad behavior, and then you reward the occasional good behavior with the sticker. Um, the thing about Rafi is that his bad behavior was unignorable, you know, or we found it unignorable. He would just, he would just kind of like escalate and escalate and escalate until we finally yelled at him, and then he'd be like, ah, oh. <laughs> thank you. Um, and so, so that didn't work for us, like ignoring it, and the sticker chart, um, it, it was, I think this is in the book, we, we made a sticker chart where um, we were like, you know, Rafi, if you don't hit us and you eat your dinner and you go to sleep, you know, and we had these categories, and, um, you know, you'll, you'll get a sticker every day. And then he's like, wait, I want you to also get stickers. And um, we were like, okay, what should the categories, you know, what, like, what should we get stickers for, Rafi? And he's like, well, the same, you know, for not hitting. Bad <laughs> anyway, idea. <laughs> um, eating your dinner and going to sleep, which we successfully did every day on the gravity. Um, and, um, but he didn't care. He would just, he'd be like, can I, and I'll put the stickers on your turn. You know, he'd just like the stickers. And he liked giving us stickers. And he didn't really care that he wasn't getting stickers. So anyway, that didn't work. And, um, and then we did the other, the opposite of that, which is, um, this kind of tradition, which is now called gentle parenting. It wasn't called that even five years ago. It was called positive discipline. Anyway, it's, it, you know, you listen to the child. They, when they're frustrated, you mirror their frustration. You say, oh, you're so frustrated. You can't have ice cream. That's, we're very frustrated about that. And, 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 and Rafi would be like, yes, and very frustrated, and it wouldn't help, it would even just like, he would just, he'd be like, he would, it would make him even more frustrated, he'd be like, yes, I'm frustrated, you know that I'm frustrated, and yet you still won't give me this thing that I want, um, and, all, and, and like Emily, my wife, was, was pretty good at that, and I was, I was not, I was not good at that, I, it just didn't have it in me, I couldn't do, I couldn't do it. And you're pretty candid about your, your, fa your occasional failings in the book. <laughs> yes, my, my many films, yes. And, and um, I mean, it's, and it's, it's in a way, like, it, uh, cynically, I mean, one of the things that's interesting is, um, so, so cynically, you're like, okay, 
these experts, right? They come out with these books, and you're supposed to fail, right? And you're not supposed to succeed at carrying out the advice because then the market would dry up, right? Um, it would be a category killer, as they say in the movies, right? Um, but but you're supposed to fail, and then you you're like, I need another advice book. Right? right, because that one didn't, I, I couldn't do it. It was my fault. So you kind of blame yourself. It's a I, trap. It's, it's a, tra a trap. Yeah, and I certainly blame myself. You know, and, and rightfully. And but you know, an interesting thing that happens actually when you start. I published some of these essays um, over the years, and um, I would start getting emails from. You know, I get emails from parents. I get emails from people who wanted to psychoanalyze me and my child, <laughs> which was annoying. Um, and then. Actually, interestingly, that was like, you know, I would publish an essay and people would psychoanalyze me. They'd be like, your mother, you know, they'd psychoanalyze my parents. That was very annoying. Um, but, and, and it was actually, you know, it, was, it felt, you felt like, like attacked, right? right. Um, with the book, it's been um, in a way worse, but also better because people will read a review of the book. Right. They're like, I haven't actually read the book, but I read a review of the book and here's my psychoanalysis <laughs> of your parents. Um, so that, and then you're like, oh, that's clearly ridiculous, well, right? I mean, that actually <laughs> lends itself to a question, and I wrestle with this too because I write about my family and I write about my kids. What are the ethics of writing about your children? Oh, and wow. you know, uh -huh. what did you talk about with Emily when you think you know, is your are your kids gonna read this someday and be like, Dad, I didn't yes. give you my permission. You know, what what was your thought process yeah. and what was your Um That is a let me I just wanna finish my thought from the previous question yeah. and then I'll I, yeah. will, I will tackle that very naughty issue. <laughs> um, I know. Yeah, but oh but so but but another type of email that I would get would be from doctors who are like I'm a doctor, and I've written a book that will solve all your problems. And getting those, and like one thing you're like, oh my god, there's like way more of these books out there than I realized. Um, but the other thing that I realized is they're written like in earnest, right? Yeah. They are written in earnest. They're not most of them cynically written. Like the doctor really thinks that they can solve your problems, and they can't. <laughs> and because like because your kid is this very particular person, and you yourself, as a parent, are a particular person, and you can only do the sort of thing that you is like available to you in your personality. So, um, and that's and that's partly what the kind of that last essay, Bear Dad, is me sort of understanding that I have, though I grew up in the U.S., I've, I've kind of inherited a lot of stuff from my dad, and um, all good all good things, <laughs> father. <laughs> uh, but you know, and and that I'm 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 much I'm much more like him as a parent than I had expected I would be, right? And, you know, and that really kind of, the best I can do is kind of work with that and be the kind of best version of that uh, parent that I can be, and it's not probably gonna look like how to talk so your kids will listen, and, you know, it's gonna look a little, it's gonna look like my version of that. And, and you know, so I do, I do think the parent books have some useful tips that can come, you know, in handy in certain situations. Um, and the mistake is to try to kind of uh, apply them as a total system, right? It's especially if you're just like not set up as a person to do that. Um, the ethics of writing, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, uh, you know, when, Raff, when I was writing, you know, I started writing these when Rafi was three. And at that point, it was very hard to imagine him ever caring. <laughs> you know, he, he was so little. Um, and then I kept writing them, and he got a little older and older, and then the book came out, and he could read, right? And that's terrifying. Like, he's just, he's read. He hasn't read the whole book, um, but he's read. He like, that well, would be impressive. Yes. That would, <laughs> he would he, be a child genius. He, he, he's dipped into it. Yeah. He's, he said, um, one of, he's made, like, various perceptive comments, but one of them was, this shouldn't be called Raising Rafi. It should be called All of Dad's Thoughts. <laughs> Which I thought, I was like, that's right. That's right. This is just my thoughts. It's not really... Anything else? Um, but <laughs> then he was like, "Dad, am I going to be famous?" And I was like, "Nah, probably." I'm, my books are not like they don't sell that many copies. And he's like, "Well, is that because you're a bad writer?" <laughs> and I was like, "No, it's because I'm a good writer." Yeah, exactly. Um, and but we were reading Harry Potter at the time, and he's like, "Well, if you were as good a writer as J.K. Rowling, you know, then lots of people would buy your books." There's still know. time. There's, well, yes, yes. Buy Raising Rapid. <laughs> buy many copies. Um, yeah, and so it's been, you know, uh, there's like a big debate about this, and it's become a bigger debate because of social media, right? So mm -hmm. the number of people who write 
books about their kids is, is very tiny. The number of people who post photos of their right. kids on Instagram and Facebook is millions. Um, and we're beginning to see some of those kids growing up and saying, hey, I didn't, we don't, I didn't consent to that. I didn't consent right. to that. We don't, I don't think we've seen any lawsuits. I, I think we're, we're still, the journalists are still waiting for the There's lawsuit. There's the Nirvana kid. Say, say more, I don't know. Oh, the, the little kid who appeared on the cover in 1992 of the Nirvana album. In utero. Yeah, sued. Sued? Yes. And? I don't know how it okay. turned out. Okay. I think okay. it went poorly. Wow, uh, for the kid? I, I think so. Oh, interesting. Um, so, you know, and, and I, yeah, I think these are interesting questions, right? Yeah. Because as a, you know, in the, in, the, in the case of both Facebook and Raising Rafi, the parent has rights also, right? Like, this is, this is my family, right? Mm -hmm. This is my life. I mean, I'm, I'm describing my life, uh, which changed very much uh, with the appearance of Rafi in it, right? Um, and, you know, but, but Rafi can't consent. Right, I mean, he, he can, he's a minor, but also he was three. <laughs> right, he, he, he still doesn't. I mean, even now he's seven. Like he still doesn't totally understand what it means, right? To mm -hmm. have a book. Um, so it's very complicated. I mean, ultimately, I'm actually writing an article right now about um, kids who have been written about by their parents uh, and, and who are now grown up. Oh, and you know, and they're very fascinating, kind of different experiences. So, so the most famous. Um, instance of a child growing up to resent um, their father uh, for putting them in a book is uh, Christopher Robin Milne uh, from Winnie the Pooh, um, who, you know, it, that's like the most famous children's book mm -hmm. of all time, and it really like followed him around in a way that um, he didn't always like. Um, but then he opened, you know, he, uh, he, he went to the, he went, he was in, he was of the generation that fought in World War II. He had an injury, not a major injury, but he was injured, comes back from the war, and you know, there are these newspaper articles like, Christopher Robin is back from the war, yeah. you know, what's he gonna do? Uh, but there was an economic depression and he couldn't find a job, right? So he's like, I'm Christopher Robin, but I can't find a job. What's going on? And ultimately he opened a bookstore, um, which his mother was like, why are you opening a bookstore? You hate the fact <laughs> that you're in this book. Um, so it was complicated, you know, and then he became, then he wrote uh, two memoirs that were pretty, well, you know, were pretty good and pretty well received, but, but, but he, he found it to be a kind of burden. Um, another, uh, and he's not around, but I interviewed um, uh, the author Shirley Jackson, some of you will know, um, wrote these amazing, hilarious, delightful um, pieces about being uh, the mother of four kids. Um, uh, one of them, they reflected in uh, two books. One is called Life Among the Savages, and the other is called Raising Demons. So it gives you some idea of kind of the tenor <laughs> of those books. Um, and I interviewed her, and like the kind of hero, uh, the, the most kind of, um, you know, rap stallion of her children is the oldest one, Lori, uh, who appears in those stories under his own name. Um, his real name is Lawrence. He's now 80. And I interviewed him, and he's like, I loved it. I loved, I loved seeing those stories. You know, we'd go to a barber shop, and I get my hair cut, and there was a magazine there, and a story about me was in it. Mm -hmm. And um, but he he said that the trick was, um, when uh, when these stories would come out, or like a collection would come out, and they would you know his mother would receive a payment, she would all she would take them all to the toy store, <laughs> and get them all a toy and kind of make them part of the action. Yeah. And he is they now- They deserved a cut. <laughs> yeah, they deserved a cut. And he's now the executor of her estate, so he's still getting a cut of, of so um, when I received the on-pub uh, payment for raising Rafi, I took Rafi to Target and he picked out a toy. So I hope, um, and it was, very, it was actually like a remote control bird, which was very, um, it was a very cool toy, but it, and it's like really like a, it has like wings, but it, um, it's very delicate. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Ilya stepped on it, like on like the second very day. Very symbolic. <laughs> well, yeah. So then I was like, okay. And then Rafi was very upset. So I was like, okay, I'll get you a replacement, but just one replacement. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, I hope that'll kind of smooth over our future relations. I want to talk to you a little bit about the nature of modern fatherhood, which you address at the outset in sort of, you know, pretty candid terms. You were still concerned about yourself and, you know, how much time do you have to write? and 
things like that, but you're also part of this generation that's been more active fathers than I think have ever existed in the past. Um, what is your take on the um, burdens or duties or aspirations of modern fatherhood? If you had to explain it to someone who's about to embark on this journey for the first time. Mm. Um, yeah, I would say if you want to maintain civil relations <laughs> with your co-parent, uh, do not write a book <laughs> about parenting. That would be my first bit of the book. Um, but yeah, no, but um, actually I, I, I want to take the opportunity to say, um, you know, there's a little anecdote at the beginning of the book where I talk about um, uh, my dad and my beloved second grade teacher, Ms. Lynch, um, who's here today. Um, and and I, so I had this conversation with my dad about, I just talked to Ms. Lynch um, uh, on the phone for, for one of the pieces about you know, during the pandemic, I was really struggling with whether Rafi should be in Zoom uh, pre-K all the time. And um, so I reached out to um, Marsha Lynch and uh, to talk about education. And then um, we had a great conversation that I was talking to my dad. And I said, you know, remember Ms. Lynch from second grade? And he said, no. And I said, well, surely you met her at a parent-teacher conference. And my dad said, no, I was at work. <laughs> and he just laughed. And um, I just thought that was, you know, I would, um, and my dad was a, was a great dad, very involved, very interested in, in my life, drove me to every soccer and hockey practice and game, hundreds of them. Um, I have no complaints. But it was, to him, it was um, just not something that he would do. Like, he was at work, right? So he couldn't go to the parent-teacher conference. To me, it's like something I, I couldn't, I can't miss a parent-teacher conference. They're so interesting, <laughs> right? Um, and it really struck me then. I was like, oh, and and most of the, and most of the dads I know, you know, are like that. Like where like we are really just like, we go to the parent teacher conferences. We we do the drop off and the pickup, you know, because um, it's interesting to us and, and it's that's what we want to do, right? So uh, I do feel like we are, and at the same time, we haven't achieved again with some exceptions. We have not achieved total equality, right? Like ultimately, Emily, you know, is the kind of parent of last resort, right? The kids, you know, and it's it's <laughs> the kids don't expect much from me, <laughs> so they don't they don't really give me a hard time. And you know, if if both of us are in the apartment, it's the you know, if they need a glass of milk or a snack, they're gonna ask mama, you know, um, which she finds frustrating. She's like, Dad is right over there. Right. Um, <laughs> So, so, so we're still on the way to like full equality, um, but I do think it's a kind of interesting moment, right? Where, yeah, like for various reasons. I mean, it's my job. I, you know, my dad, like his job was like he went to work every day from you know nine to five. Or, you know, and even though it was like a creative, it wasn't like a factory job. It was a creative job doing software engineering, but he was expected to be there all the time. My job, I kind of go there like twice a week. You know, and the rest of the time I'm zooming and you know whatever, uh, talking on the phone. And I think so. Kind of the nature of uh, the way we work has changed. The kind of structure of the workforce, right? Where yeah. most families or a lot of families are two, you know, with two working parents in them. Um, so I do think it's a it's an interesting moment for dads. Um, you know, one thing that I appreciated in your book, and I don't think that you see this a lot um, in writers who live in New York, there is like, where does the money come from? Who, who is who's the benefactor who's paying for the career and paying for the apartment? And you're pretty candid about renting a small apartment and trying to juggle it all. Mm -hmm. Do you ever, or can you explain sort of how, how you make it work, um, but also why are you or have you ever second guessed, and I know your wife has written a little bit about this, being so wedded to a life that might at the outset seem a little impractical at times in Brooklyn? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I, I worried about that a little bit because it's like, when I was writing the book and I, you know, one friend was like, was like, you need to like give the dollar numbers. Yeah. It was like, you, cause <laughs> I, don't, I don't actually, you know. Yeah. Um, and because because I was like, if I gave you the actual like dollar numbers, you would think I made a lot of money, and you would not understand <laughs> why we have all these money problems, right? But I mean, the answer is it's just New York's extremely expensive, right. um, you know. But but then I was like, oh, but you know, actually, like, no matter where you live, you're gonna have 
money. Like, there's going to be somebody down the street who has more money, right? It doesn't matter, like, whether in, certainly the case in New York, but right. it's the case in most places, right? Um, I don't know. I mean, like, we just, I mean, it, hap it, it happens to be where my job is, right? So we couldn't actually move, even if we wanted to. Um, uh, it's where our kids were born, and it's where all our friends are, and um, we like it there. And we want to stay. So yeah, it, it, it is. It, New York is a uh, is not an easy place to to raise kids. But I don't know that there is a, an easy place to raise kids. And I and I, I spent the first the, my Rafi years um, in Moscow. You know, also like not the world's most convenient city. <laughs> it's fair. Yeah. 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 Um, can you talk a little bit about the? I, I enjoyed this chapter having children the same age and thinking about the types of schools that you wanted to send them to. And there were three different schools that you were weighing, right? And that was yeah. each one had drawbacks and pros and cons, and you were sort of morally wrestling with. Yes, I don't. Right? I don't know if that's the situation in Boston. Um, in New York. Um, you have your kind of zone schools, but there's a ton of wiggle room, and it creates this environment of um, just a lot of parents kind of gaming the system, right? And and there's and then, then there are unzoned schools, which are they're, they're charter schools, but then there are these kind of magnet schools that have special programs. Maybe they have French immersion. Maybe they have you know a special thing where they don't teach you to read until second grade which actually was good. Um, uh, and so it, it, it sort of creates this environment of, I need to find um, the ideal school for my child, right? Rather than just going to the school down the street. Um, but then when we were going through this process, um, Donald Trump had just been elected um, and the journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones had published these articles about um, school segregation. And just you know the kind of the shocking uh, thing that she discovered was that schools are more segregated than they were 30 years ago, um, which I did not know. You know, I kind of thought we were slowly but surely making progress, but basically it turns out, um, you know, there been the Brown versus the Board of Education, very slow impl implementation, court mandates, schools did become gradually more segregated, and the high point was like 1988, and then. Uh, sorry, more desegregated, less segregated. Um, and then, the high, so the high point of desegregation is 1988, and then since then we've been rolling back. And New York, as she further discovered, is one of the most segregated cities, uh, school systems in the country. Um, so that, so it was kind of, um, so I was like, okay, we need to find school for Rafi that um, is a good school, is a school that can like deal with Rafi, <laughs> and but also um, not contribute to segregation, right? And so I just got it all like a huge tizzy about it, and um, you know, and, and and also I had this experience of my parents, uh, you know, their kind of chief, you know, there are many reasons to leave the Soviet Union, but like for, for them with kid with two kids, the, one of the I maybe mean, number one was like they didn't want us going to Soviet schools. They want they didn't. And they didn't want us going through the anti-Semitic university admissions process in the Soviet Union. So, sort of the idea of like, um, you know, my, I was like, my parents moved halfway across the world, right? So I could go to Driscoll Elementary School. Um, you know, surely I could like move down the block <laughs> right. into a different school zone. Um, you know, and but it's, yeah, it, it uh, ultimately I feel like we we ended up with a, with a school that we love and. and you know, that is not a segregated school, and it, you know, and, and yet, um, I do feel like I, that whole process led me, you know, we moved, actually, we moved into a different school zone, I wish we had just stayed in our old school zone, that would have been fine, too. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but it, you know, it, was, it felt like something that um, had been written about in this kind of, like, investigative way, um, really well. Uh, uh, by, by numerous journals, but Nicole Hannah Jones is kind of the most notable one. And then, but I was like, okay, here's what it's actually like when you try to solve for all those uh, factors. And it was complicated. Um, this is a, such, such a thoughtful book, and you're a thoughtful parent, and I think most of us strive to be thoughtful parents. But at the end of the day, 
how much do you think it matters? You know, how much does it really? I mean, I think about this a lot. Yeah. You know, what is my child going to retain and remember? Um, what are the lessons that I, you know, the things that seem so important in yeah. the moment? What, what is going to matter and what will they remember and what won't they? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I so at, uh, so it's at the end of the book in that Bear Dad chapter, I, I talk about this uh, developmental psychologist named Don Jonathan Tudge who um, did all these. Uh, his whole career has been basically looking at uh, parenting and children's experience across different cultures. And, um, you know, basically his conclusion is like, mm, you know, you're going to parent the way your kind of society parents. Um, also, you're going to parent the way your parents parented. Um, none of it matters. <laughs> right? He says development will occur, right? Like, development will occur. Um, and I found that very, like, kind of very heartening. Um, also kind of a rebuke to all the kind of worry that I'd had. Um, and still, I, you know, am I going to, like, would I bet, how much would I bet, you know, that, that it doesn't matter? Like, it's, surely it matters somewhat, right? And We can hope. Yeah, I and mean, then, you know, so, I don't know. And, like, it's, it's also, like, uh, I'm not, it's, it's not like I'm trying to be a super parent. Right? It's like, it's more like I'm just trying to like not yell at my kids all the time, you know? <laughs> because, right? And like, so, yeah. so, so it's, it's more like that. Like, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I don't know how much of like the enriching things we do are going to stay with them, but like, I do think about like yelling at them like every five minutes, which is my impulse. Yeah. That, that's not great. Right. You know, so, um, yeah. Is it different <laughs> with the second though? Do you find that it's a different process? It, it is. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, um, you know, with Rafi, I just took stuff so personally, right? Like when he hit me, when he started, when he turned, he started hitting us. We just, we were just like, us? You know, your parents? Yeah. And how could uh, you? How could, yeah, how could you? after all we did for you. Um, and Ilya, like this angel, turns three and starts hitting us. And I was like, oh, that's just what three-year-olds do. Yeah. Um, right? but I took it personally, and um, but you know, Ilya too turns out can be a real jerk. Um, and it can get frustrating. <laughs> so, but it, but it is. I I do take think take things less personally. Um, I do feel less like with Rafi, like especially like once we had Ilya, Rafi seemed like such a giant, you know, and so much older. And I was like, you're four years old. How could you be doing this? You're four, right? right? Oh, and wow. with Ilya, I'm like. You're just, you know, Rafi is still a giant. He's seven, yeah. but Ilya is still a baby. He's just four, so it's kind of all relative. <laughs> so he he gets a lot more slack. Is it Q and A time? It, it is okay. just about Q and A. Yeah. Thank you both so much for an incredible conversation. Oh, thank you. Um, if folks in the audience have questions, raise your hand. I am going to hand you the mic, and that's just so that the folks who are tuning in on our live stream can hear whatever your question is. Ooh, there's a question in the back from Pulitzer Prize winner Megan Marshall. This is following a, a bit from Kara's question. Um, I'm wondering, you know, one of the wonderful things about the essays, I haven't read the whole book, but is, is your insights into what your upbringing was like, what you, you know, took from your parents' experience, um, which are probably not things that your father imagined you would absorb. And I'm wondering if you could sort of cast your mind forward. What, what might uh, Rafi, you know, when he's writing his memoir at 30, he's gonna, what's he gonna say about <laughs> how his parents did? Um, um, what insights? I'm not. Uh, yeah. He probably won't be critical. It'll just, it'll be very moving. And what will it be? <laughs> um, I don't. I, you know, obviously, um, we have, like you said, like we have no idea, right? Like what they're gonna remember. Um, one, one funny thing that Rafi said about this book after, after saying it should be called All of Dad's Thoughts he said I'm going to write a book and it's going to be called Raising Rafi is Fake <laughs> <laughs> where he will expose all the lies of Raising Rafi so it could be something like that um, I mean another, you know, another thing that occurred to me as I was reading this passage that I read at the beginning about uh, this feeling of like precarity that I grew up with a little bit you know um, and is that, you know, I, I wrote that, we published the book, and then like the, the month the book gets published, we get kicked out of our apartment, right? And 
have been going through this kind of awful apartment search in Brooklyn at a time of record uh, apartment prices, and um, which we seem to have found an apartment. I mean, I can announce we got a lease today. I just need to, you know, have some quibbles with the lease. I'm not like an expert on tenant leases. If anybody needs any advice on that, um, having experienced a bad lease. Um, you know, so so now Rafi is actually getting to experience some of that uh, destabilization that I thought he was going to be spared. Um, you know, and for good and ill, I, I think. Like, um, I don't know. I hope I hope he uh, I hope he remembers the good parts. <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, I'm also an immigrant, as you can probably tell, and I have a son about your age and a daughter um, who is a bit younger. And um, my question is twofold. The first one, the first part of it is, how much do you think of your angst and your search for being, if not ideal, just a not yelling father? Uh, is a product or is informed by your biculturalism, bilang uh, bilingualism, and your mm, bicultural, bilingual marriage. That's one. And another one is um, how much do you think your particular attitudes um, are typical to a generation of Russian immigrants of your age who were brought as here as kids? Mm -hmm. um, so, the, yeah, the, I, I think, um, I mean, I think my situation is a kind of, uh, the Russian word is the figure of a man, like that's kind of a... Um, exaggerated. yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, kind of exaggerated uh, situation, I think of a lot of parents of my generation where like yeah we have so many right as a, I'm I'm I grew up kind of bicultural in the sense of like I was born in Russia and Russian parents but I grew up in the US right and I have an American wife and so like I feel like there's like a lot of parenting styles that are theoretically available to me right a lot of parenting choices um, do I speak Russian to Rafi or not right so um, I, I think a lot like I think that's as I was saying earlier, like a pretty common experience, right, for, for generation of kind of displaced, you know, kind of urban cosmopolitan parents. And um, yeah, just, and, and trying to figure out which of these things we want to kind of pass on to our kids um, and which we want to leave behind. And you know, and one of the kind of interesting things that, that I found with um, uh, like fellow, you know, uh, immigrant, but like me, who came over when they were kids, who are now having kids of their own, um, where some of them decide, I'm not going to speak Russian to my kids, right? I mean, actually, like, more often than not, that's the case. Um, you know, if, if somebody came over when they were older, and, you know, and they're, they're married to somebody who's Russian, they will both speak Russian, they'll speak Russian to the kid, but um, for somebody who came over when they were little and they're married to a non-Russian speaker, I think more often than not, they decide not to speak Russian, and I'm like very jealous of those. You know, in a way, I find that to be like a courageous decision to be like, "That's it. <laughs> Rush, the Russia stuff ends here. You know, it ends with, with me, and my kid can be free of that." Um, and I almost feel like I didn't have the courage to do that, and here we are, and I'm still speaking Russian to them, and they're still answering in English. Um, but I, yeah, I, you know, I, I do, I think like the. Some of the immigrant stuff, and, and not necessarily Russian immigrant, but like immigrant from a lot of places. Your, I think the emphasis on schooling, um, which for us was kind of the only way. Like that was, you know, for Russian immigrant kids and and our parents, the way into American society was like through the schools, and we were if we did well in school, then we could excel in this. You know, country, um, and I very much got that message. You know, and I can't, and like, 
I, I, we are now, Rafi's now at the age where he's getting homework. And we're having these arguments over, because my wife is not like that. She's like, I don't care if he does his homework, right? And, um, and I'm like, he must do his homework. And I, I almost can't help myself. Like in my mind, I'm like, I also don't actually care, but like, I, I, but I can't, I just can't help it. I, I, I'm like, he has to do his homework. Um, so I, I hope, uh, I hope he doesn't remember us arguing about whether he should do his homework. Right? <laughs> um, I do think it's, I do think it's, uh, you know, but you know, Tudge said to me this, this development said, developmental psychologist. I was like, I was like, you know, I feel like I have all these arguments with my wife because we're from these two different cultures. And he said, ah, no, like. No, cultures are not homogeneous. People from the same culture have fights all the time. <laughs> so. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to have another kind of ethnic question. So, <laughs> what kind of question? Ethnic. Ethnic, okay. So um, you said that um, your father gave you like, a good advice when you were eight. Um, take care of uh, yourself. Uh-huh, figure it out yourself. Okay. Be, being hot, essentially. Sorry? Being hard. A hard, a hard man, right? Uh -huh. So uh, your father was a hard man. I'm oh, sorry. Your, your father was a hard man, and this is a quality, okay, which you kind of like seemingly uh, ascribe to a Russian man. Yes. So uh, so my question, one of the question is, how much of this being hard, okay, do you appreciate this quality? And if not, seemingly you do not, because um, because, for example, you said that, you know, I would, I would love to would cut off Russian language, for example, right? <laughs> well, but so, it isn't. Go on. Yes. So, uh, two questions. Okay? Yeah. One is, um, <clears throat> what is it in Russian culture you would like to cut off through cutting off the language? And the second, okay, um, how much of this hardness you acquired from your father? Uh, did you value it? And are you trying or not to pass it to the son? Um, that's a good, that's... I think that's a profound question. I mean, so you know, in the book, I, I describe a conversation I had with um, Natalia Kandor, which was not here today. Um, she is. Oh, she's she oh, is. oh, hi, hi. Nice to see you. Um, so we yes, we had this. Um, uh, it's in the book. Um, you know, we we so for you know, I I say, you know, Dr. Kandor. Oops, so and Dr. Kandor was a uh, for those who don't know or haven't read it um, was a pediatrician. Um, uh, here in Boston and, and in Brooklyn, yeah, no, just in Boston. But uh, for a time, it was and was my pediatrician. Um, uh, was the pediatrician for uh, Masha's kids when they would come here. Uh, was for a time the only Russian pediatrician in the Boston area. A legendary figure. I'm very happy to see you. Um, and we had this interesting conversation. I, I, I thought where where I was like, well, you know, can you compare Russian and American parenting? And um, and Dr. Kandor said, well, American parenting is much better. You know, Russian parents are always criticizing their kids. And they would sit in my waiting room, and in 20 minutes, they would make 20 criticisms. And the American parents would make zero. And clear, you know, and I, tell me if I'm misinterpreting what you said, but I, to, to me, it seemed like she was saying, American parenting is superior. And then, you know, and, and, and then, uh, we talked about uh, the teenage years. Russian parents really don't know how to handle sort of this, this spirit of rebellion and, and you know, disattachment that happens in the teenage years. American parents are prepared for that and, and kind of give their kids their freedom. Again, American parenting is better. And, um, you know, and, and, and to me, and, and, and I, uh, you know, I don't know, Yura, it, from where the questions that you were asking were coming from, whether you agreed with me or not, but... Um, to, to me, it was not a, an atypical kind of uh, thinking about Russian versus American culture uh, in the emigrant community, right? Oh, hold on. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so, so I felt like, okay, um, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of, you know, the generation of my parents who came over lo loved America, right? Like, thought there were so many wonderful things about it as compared to Russia. So I was like, okay. This is not a surprising um, series of statements from somebody who's observed both Russian and American parenting. But then I said, well, are there any things that you would keep uh, from Russian parenting? And, and then there started to be all these things. And Dr. Kondor said, well, I like it that you know, kids are taught to memorize. 
uh, you know, poems. And I like it that they're taught manners. You know, Russian kid will never say shut up to his parents, as Rafi went through a period, but, but it ended of saying shut up to us. But he stopped, actually. Um, and, and, then, and, then she, and then she said, you know, and, and I, I like the emphasis on schooling, right? And I was like, oh, you know, my wife doesn't care about schooling. And, and she said something that I thought was very profound. She said, we both know that doing well in school opens up the world to you. It does. Um, and, and then we were like in this bind where I was like, okay, but so there are these things about Russian parenting that we all value. <laughs> and then there are these things about Russian parenting that we don't value. And how do we, what do we do? It's not about Russian parenting. Go ahead. Yeah. Parenting is like a process, right? Mm -hmm. It's a matter. Uh -huh. It's about values. Do, do you see any values in your father's, for example, background? The values which he tried to inculcate and embed in Right? Yes. And, and the value which you would like to pass along, right? Yes. Or, or let's say you say, okay, along with uh, this guy I mentioned in the book, that it doesn't matter, okay, whatever I try to do, okay, the result will be uh, like some mysterious, okay, something will come out, okay, which, which uh, doesn't depend on your parents. So, so my question was, is there a Russian culture, in Russian, not culture, in Russian way of being a man, for example, or a role in a family, or anything, okay, uh, which you value, and the second is, let's say, what was the real reason, okay, for you uh, for wanting, okay, to cut off, let's say, through, the, through language? Yeah, that's my question, too. Because, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, and that actually about YouTube, because it kind of sounds like it was really hard for you to cut off your Russian roots. And with my own child, I didn't really um, uh, kind of, sorry, I probably didn't think enough and appreciate enough how much of a dilemma it was for her. And uh, that's my question to you. You still seem to be kind of questioning your Russian roots, sort of, and, and, and I want to get rid of them. I mean, in view of latest events, yeah, I understand yes. that a lot of my friends, when they ask where are they from, they're afraid to say that, not afraid, ashamed, to say that they're uh, from Russia, yeah. okay, because they don't want to be, but prior to that, I mean, I didn't, I guess I didn't appreciate enough how much of a struggle and a question was it for your generation, actually, uh, to kind of figure out who you are, to find your identity, your American identity, and how much of Russian news you wanted to keep. So, I, I'm, I'm going to, but, you know, there are many things about my father that I admire tremendously. My father has never complained about anything. <laughs> it's just, it's never, it's just not a, like a mode that he has to complain, you know. Um, I find that incredibly admirable. <laughs> um, I very much want to, you know, pass that on. I, I, I want to cultivate that in myself. I want to pass it on to my kids. I mean, what I was trying to say is that I think there are these incredibly admirable things about the way that um, you all are. <laughs> but you seemingly connected some some clause to your father to being a Russian. Like, yeah. Yes. Like Russian men are hard. Yes. You said, right? Yes. So, so uh, this question again, okay. Do you find any good, okay, or uh, uh, sort of like uh, admirable qualities yes. in your ethnic sort of like background? Okay? Well, no, but that is, I mean, like not complaining is a, is a, is a, you know, being hard or tough. That's not complaining. I mean, that's one of those. Those are connected things to me. And like, um, but but to to throw the question back at you a little bit, Masha, your daughter, spent time in Russia. In the nineties, mm -hmm. when she was going to Russia, were you worried? It's a, it's a long word. Yeah. Yes, we were. Yes. So I, you know, to to me, it's like, um, you know, and I remember my dad was worried when I went to Russia. You know. It's not like growing up, it's not like having, you know, um, a child, you know, it's not like being from France <laughs> or Italy, where you're like, oh, I can't wait for my kid to go to Paris for the summer, right? Our kids are going to go to Moscow or, you know, at, or St. Petersburg, right? It's just like, it's complicated. It's scary. Uh, Rafi so little. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, what you say, with the way things are now, yes, the way things are now, in Russia are, it's horrible, but they, when I was writing that essay three years ago, they weren't great, you know? 
Um, I mean, the joke in the book is, I, I read this uh, German linguist uh, from the 30s who um, had kept this very painstaking account of teaching his daughter German in mm -hmm. Chicago, and then um, he goes, you know, and then, you know, and he's very frustrated. It was very, I loved reading it because it was so much like my own experience. He was very frustrated. You know, he kept speaking German to her. She would answer in English. He just didn't seem to be teaching her German. Then they go to Germany in 1935, right, for the summer, Hitler's Germany, and she learns German. <laughs> and then they come back, you know, they don't stay there. But, um, and the joke in the book is, well, if, if Werner Leopold can take his, his family to Hitler's Germany, surely I can take Rafi to Putin's Russia. But that joke now is a little, reads a little differently, right? Like, I'm not, I was, we were gonna go this summer, I'm not going this summer, right? So, I hope you can understand my my uh, ambivalence about you know Russia. You, you guys left. You're you're the most ambivalent about it of all. You. <laughs> but I don't understand your comment that some of your fans made yes. a courageous decision. Yeah, they made a decision. Yeah, no, no, yeah. no, no. Uh -huh. Never to speak Russian to their kid. Uh -huh. So How much time is, is it courageous? Why is it courageous? I don't see that. Excuse That's me. Courageous. Folks, <laughs> excuse me. I appreciate that you have, you're have. you very passionate, and that is great. I do want to give other folks a chance to ask questions. Um, so we'll just we have, to be continued. Yes. Um, so we'll, we'll wrap this question up right here, and we do have time for one more if anyone has any more uh, questions that they would like to ask. No one, no one can follow the rest. <laughs> um, All right. Wonderful. Well, on that note, thank you, Kara. Thank you. You're welcome. So thank, much you. thank you. So for much. this wonderful conversation. I am sorry to, to have it interrupted, but hopefully you can continue <laughs> afterward. I just wanted to offer the offer the offer the floor to, to other folks. But um, thank you all to our audience uh, just for coming. Um, if we could give one more warm round of applause to these.